All right, so for this lecture, it's time to kind of get our Mac on. And by Mac, I mean the most notorious and probably infamous ethical philosopher that has ever existed named Niccolo Machiavelli. And what makes him kind of infamous and what makes Machiavelli pretty interesting, especially compared to the other ethical philosophers that we have discussed, is a lot of the virtues and uh, morals and ethical systems that like Aristotle and Plato believed to be the highest forms of good are not always considered good, especially in the world of Machiavelli. Machiavelli is eventually going to teach us that the only thing that can be considered good is anything that helps you achieve an objective and a goal or anything that you desire any tool that you can use to achieve that ends is justified. This is where you get that whole motto, uh, do the ends justify the means or do the means justify the ends? Well, Machiavelli was certainly in the camp where he believed that the ends certainly justify the means, which means if you don't know what that translates into is as long as you know, take Hiroshima and Nagasaki, a horrible means to achieve a greater good, right? So got to kind of break a few eggs to make an omelet. And that's really what Machiavelli is about. But let's get some historical context first. Uh, Machiavelli was a uh, philosopher back um, in Italy when it was separated into city-states. You know, uh, just imagine Italy not being the country it is, but being broken down more like uh, how the United States has different states, so did Italy. You know, Rome, Venice, uh, Milan, uh, Naples, these were all countries in and of themselves, which means they all had kings or they all had princes in charge. What that translated to back in the day was much like we discussed with Thomas Hobbes, was Italy was always in a consistent state of nature. They were always at war with one another. And so Machiavelli realized, hey, if we're ever going to be as strong as we were when we were once known as the Roman Empire, then this division is no longer acceptable. This means I'm going to have to teach someone the dark side of the force. This is what Machiavelli said. And basically by teaching him the prince, this is why the book that he wrote is called The Prince, because he wrote it for the prince of Florence at the time. And Florence was the strongest city-state in Italy because that's where all the banking was. Um, but he realized that for Italy to become strong again, he's going to have to teach the young prince of Florence how to use manipulation and deception, subterfuge, strategic thinking. Essentially, he needed to teach his young prince or whoever was going to be in charge of, of Italy at the time, how to view life like a game of chess. And so, the end game for him was by teaching the prince kind of the dark side of ethics, you take that ethical codes, those morals and virtues, and you take them from the dark, and they don't quite come to the light, but like in a yin-yang symbol, but it's more of a gray area. And as we discussed kind of day one, ethics in real ethics, there is no black and white. Everything is just a shade of gray. It's all based on context. And so to create this unified Italy, Machiavelli had to teach the prince how to treat the other city-states as if they were opponents in a chess game. So today's lecture is gonna be broken down into two primary sections we're going to learn two strategies that are needed to gain power. And then we're gonna focus on three or four strategies on how to keep power.
right? Because that's what Machiavelli is all about, power. Why is power important in ethics? Because as we know from the first lecture video, morality is created by culture. And culture is usually grown by whatever group of people is the most influential at the time. And influence is power. Power is influence. It's, you know, you could, if you're a king on an island, are you really a king? Or are you just telling yourself you're a king? Because you have no influence. There's no one around you. For you to have power, you got to be able to influence people to do things to achieve your objective once again. So let's jump in. Let's jump into how to gain power. All right. Machiavelli says that there are two things that every prince or every person trying to gain power needs to have. Those are virtue, which is not spelled, it's not virtue, right? Virtue is V-I-R-T-U. So it's almost like virtue, just leave the E off. But you got to have virtue and fortuna, all right? Virtue and fortuna. Let's first discuss virtue. Virtue is essentially any skill set or ability that is inherent in you that allows you to achieve your goal, that allows you to win, that allows you to reach an objective. Um, it's, like I said, any ability you excel at that is directed towards the achievement of a goal, right? For example, take chess. A virtue in chess would be something like deception, intellect, and strategic thinking. These are all virtues that you need to win, right? Let's say we're playing chess and you are a six foot five, 300 pound, built like a linebacker, and we're playing chess. Well, that person's virtues, Machiavelli would say, is probably that he's just an athletic specimen. Like he is just built for athleticism. Well, that virtue, when putting, put that man behind a chessboard, all of a sudden being tall and strong are no longer virtues because they don't allow him to win the game. They don't allow him to win at chess. He does, therefore, it's not a virtue. Remember how Aristotle said that, you know, a virtue, virtue for anyone is any like skill set or ability or character trait that is unique to them that allows them to contribute to the greater good of a society, right? Well, Machiavelli kind of thought virtue was the same as an Aristotelian virtue, but the big difference was is that he didn't care about does your virtue contribute to the greater good of a society? He only cared about does your virtue contribute to you winning, to you achieving your goal, all right? So, the question now is, well, how do you know what type of virtue is needed? Well, Machiavelli says the best way to learn this is by essentially learning from history. You know how history professors always bang and bang on about, you've got to learn lessons from the past or else we're doomed to repeat it. Well, that's pretty accurate. Um, in fact, he says that if you want to learn, you know, strategies on how to win, just read about great victors from the past, whether it be politicians, generals, whoever, learn from what they did. But he forewarns, you can't follow their examples too rigidly. For example, if you tried to conquer a city the way Julius Caesar did, you would be successful up into a point until you get stabbed by your own people. So this is why, to use the same example, his... Uh, and I forget if it was his nephew or godson or whatever. His name was Octavian. Well, when Caesar was killed by his own people, he, in his will, he left everything to Octavian, including his name. So no longer was he Octavian of the Julii. Now he was Augustus Caesar. And 
just like Julius Caesar, Augustus wanted Rome to be powerful again. And he learned from great histories of great figures of the past, which was his uncle, fortunately. And he saw what his uncle did that worked. But more importantly, he noticed what didn't work. And so when Octavian, Caesar Augustus, came to Rome the same way Julius did, you know, brought his armies to the gates of Rome, uh, he took control. But you know, Julius made the mistake <laughs> of forgiving and pardoning the people that he knew were, who hated him. Octavian, he didn't make that mistake. Once he got in charge, he found the people that were, one, guilty of conspiring against killing Caesar, Julius Caesar, and two, anyone who was against him being in charge, he didn't try to make friends with him. Oh, no. He just killed them. Right? Just annihilated them. And therefore, he learned from the past mistake of his uncle. So, uh, so that way, Octavian, in this case, knew that ruthlessness was a virtue. That if you're going to get rid of a weed in your garden, you got to rip it out, not just the stem, but the roots and all. And that's exactly what Octavian did in the uh, Roman Republic. And that's why he's generally considered the greatest Roman emperor of all time. So that's what Machiavelli means by you know what virtue is needed by just seeing how people were successful in achieving what you wanted. Like if you want a promotion at work or if you want to be the next music mogul, you're probably going to watch a documentary or read a book by that person to find out how they did what they did. That's what you do, but you also have to identify what caused them to fail. Because obviously, if you make it to the top of the mountain, there's only one way to go down. So you got to find out what causes that person to decline, to devolve. And that's what Octavian did. And he fixed that so that he wouldn't lose his power, right? So virtue can be any like character trait, skill set, or ability that allows you to achieve whatever goal you desire, whether it's the goal of getting a date, whether it's the goal of running for Congress, whether it's the goal of uh, winning the football game. Different virtues are needed depending upon the context of the situation, all right? So, um, so this is why, like, a lot of people will say you're very Machiavellian in the way that you do things because you basically just kind of used me as a stepping stone or a rung on the ladder to your greater ascension to power. Well, Machiavelli said, well, yeah, obviously, <laughs> that's what I did. You know, not everyone in life can be a king or can be a bishop here. A lot of people are just pawns. And pawns serve a role just like a bishop or a rook or a king serves a role. Okay? Um, but pawns are pawns. You use them to win the game. And that's why Machiavelli says that virtue is actually a good thing because it allows you to achieve whatever you deem personally good. How convenient is that? <laughs> but virtue isn't enough. Machiavelli says you also need a little help from Lady Fortuna. That's the other thing that you need. So the other strategy to gaining power is called Fortuna, all right? It's kind of like fortune, but Fortuna. And some people say it's luck. The translation for Fortuna is luck, but it's not. At its most basic, Fortuna means opportunity, all right? Opportunity um, that, you know, everything from how people behave to a position opening up to a natural disaster. And that's why, especially natural disaster, 
Machiavelli says you cannot really, like Fortuna, the reason why you have to have it is because you can have all the virtues in the world, but if you, there's no opportunity for you to exercise that virtue, then you're just like that king on an island. You're a king, yeah, but you have no influence. You have no ability to, to project your virtue. So Machiavelli says Fortuna is very fickle. Fortuna is like the weather. At one day, it, you may say, what a great day. What a great day for to conquer the world and to do what I want. Then a rainstorm comes and all of a sudden you're, that opportunity for you to have a good time has gone away. Now you have to do something else, right? Well, uh, that's why he says Fortuna is an unreliable ally that can defect. It can change in an instant. And for this reason, that's why Machiavelli says you should leave nothing to chance. Because those with virtue, they usually succeed because oftentimes they can create their own Fortuna. They can create their own opportunity. Um, for example, say you're the greatest salesman at your company, right? And you've been the greatest salesman for five years in a row. You don't want to be a salesman anymore. You want to be management. But there's no fortuna there because there's only one management position and it's filled with person X. Someone with enough virtue wouldn't just sit around and say, I'm just going to wait for person X to retire, get fired, quit, and then I'll apply and get that job. Mm. You could do that. But that's kind of, that's, that's more of just luck rather than opportunity. And you don't need virtue for that to happen. Someone with virtue, though, they would find a way to get rid of person X, get them demoted, get them fired, or maybe even get them a better job at another company. They would find a way to sabotage that boss, or like I said, to just move them out of the way. And in that sense, they create their own fortuna by like using deception or manipulation or cunning, or greed, right? A lot of people in a management position would only move because of more money, so greed is a powerful motivator, right? So someone with enough virtue, or with the right virtue, I should say, they cr can create their own opportunity to a certain degree. You can't control everything, that's a delusion, but you can control as much as you can try. And, but to do so requires virtue. Um, um, but like I said, it's unreliable because, for example, many years ago, there was a young up and coming politician in Florida where I lived who was supposed to be the, the second coming. And uh, he was from Miami. And what happened was uh, while he was in the middle of his campaign, keep in mind, he was next best thing to slice bread. He was supposed to be the next president, but he was just running for governor at the time. But what happened is a hurricane came through and just annihilated Miami. Well, he owned a lot of housing developments there and they were kind of just not just, well, some were destroyed, but a lot of damage was done. But all of this politician's money was like channeled into his campaign so when the hurricane hit, it took him at least a month to redirect his finances from the campaign to fixing up these homes, you know, because insurance took a lot of time. Well, the news came in, investigative reporting, obviously, and basically came out and called the man a slumlord, saying that, you know, he didn't even have the finances to fix his own residences and his people were living in a state of squalor. It... So that one hurricane took, you know, this politician, tons of virtue, supposed to be the next president. But then with a bad stroke of Fortuna, that hurricane, now he's just selling insurance or used cars down in Miami, right? 
And this is why, like I said, like Machiavelli says, you, you can't rely on Fortuna because it's too fickle. It's too changeable. Um, the best you can do is hope to tame it by having the virtue to control your circumstances so that the circumstances don't control you. All right? That's the biggest way. And so that's why, you know, Machiavelli can say using the virtues of, say, force and deception are actually considered virtues because they help you control the circumstances. Uh, to give you an example, and this is like a really bad, oh, it's a lame example, but you'll get the point. Control your circumstances so they don't control you. All right. Back in the day when I used to play this video game called Madden, you know, it's a football game. Well, before I invited my friends over to come play, I used the virtue of deception. <laughs> and I went into the game and I changed the stats, the attributes of all of my players to 99. And all of the players on my friend's team were the same as they were. They were just average. And so I kept beating him like 56 to nothing, 72 to three, just annihilating scores. And he just kept saying, how do you keep beating me so badly? It wasn't because of skill. It was because I used the virtue of deception to create an environment where I am going to be able to win. So by changing the, the attributes of all of my players, I essentially created a, like, there was no way I could lose. I'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to lose. And that's what Machiavelli says by, you got the only way to control, I mean, you can't control, but the only way to tame Fortuna is to use your virtue to basically have a response to every action, right? Basically, he means you got to plan for every contingency. So, for instance, uh, what he means by, you know, control the to control Fortuna, prepare for every contingency is, let's say you're trying to, let's go back to the business example. Let's try and say you're trying to get your boss fired or trying to get them you know, uh, move to a different company, a different branch. Um, and to do so, you use the, the virtue of, uh, say deception, a deception manipulation, and you tell his, your manager's boss, you tell them something negative about the manager, hoping that, you know, say your manager is just the branch manager and you go to the regional manager and you tell the regional manager, you know, my, you, something's wrong with my employer because man, my manager is doing X and X is hurting us. Okay. To think that that is enough to control Fortuna is simple. It's simple-minded. It doesn't work. When he says plan for every contingency, he means, okay, if I tell the regional manager this bad thing about my boss, I now have to plan for every contingency of what's going to happen. Contingency A, my boss, that regional manager, is going to have a conversation with my boss and is going to bring up what I told them. When that happens, what am I going to say? Because if you don't plan for that contingency, the Fortuna you thought you were creating is now going to be like that hurricane and it's going to probably come back at you and get you fired if you don't know the right thing to say, right? So basically, and like I said, it, it just use chess or checkers as a metaphor. If you move a piece here to control Fortuna and luck, you gotta go, if I move it here, then that means they would have to move their piece here or here and nowhere else. And if I know that's gonna happen, then I can adapt, then I can adjust. I can use the virtue of cunning and intellect and strategic think tactical thinking 
and every move they make, I have a counter move to it. And that's basically what it is. To The best way to control, to tame Fortuna is you gotta be quick on your feet. You gotta be able to adapt to every contingency so that you can control the circumstances so that the circumstances don't control you, all right? So if you want to just know how to gain power, like a math formula, ability plus opportunity equals power. In other words, virtu plus fortuna equals power. Now, gaining the power, believe it or not, is the easy part. Because power is like love. It's so easy to fall in love. But as we know, it's very hard to stay in love. That's, don't believe me? Why is there a 60% divorce rate? It is hard to keep, to, to maintain anything, all right? So we have to learn a couple strategies now on how to keep power. Um, we are only going to kind of focus on, let's see, you only need to know three, three strategies to keep power. Now, he gives about like anywhere between seven to ten, but here are the three major ones you need to know. The first way to keep power is we kind of have to ask ourselves, if you're in a powerful position, then you're, you're going to be surrounded by either the nobles, which we would call, say, the rich elite, or the masses, the poor, right? Usually, it's, there was no middle class back in the time he wrote this philosophy. So you're either nobility or you are a peasant, okay? So the question is, if you're trying to keep your power, which means you already have it, so if you keep it, who do you appeal to? Do you appeal to the nobles or do you appeal to the peasants, to the masses? This was the question he proposed to his young prince. The young prince, being a prince, was somewhat, not somewhat, pretty much biased and automatically said, well, the nobility, the rich people, is who you want to support you. That's where you want to draw your power from. Not so fast, Turbo, Machiavelli says. Because at the end of the day, are there more noble pieces on a chess set or more peasant pieces on a chess set? Well, there are more pawns than there are rooks, knights, bishops, kings, and queens, right? So for that reason, the nobles, the rich, they may seem to be more attractive because they have more access to positions of power, uh, they have the money, and money is needed to raise armies or it's needed to, to help political campaigns, right? You gotta have money. So automatically you may think that they're the ones to get your power from. Not so fast, Machiavelli says, because he says you need to uh, try to avoid allying yourself with the nobility because they have one critical failing. They will only offer their support only if it serves their purpose. In other words, I'm not going to donate to a political campaign if I know for a fact that if that politician wins, they're going to do things that I don't like. I'm only going to donate to a political campaign if they do something that will benefit me. Otherwise, why give them money, right? So to, that's why you have to avoid getting your power from people who are richer or more powerful from you. Because if you go that path, you become dependent upon them and you basically lose all of your power and you're like a, uh, you're a paper tiger. You, the rich person is the one who's in charge and you're just you're a paper, you're just a weightless president or you're a weightless prince. You just have no gravity to you. You're weak. Therefore, that the person would always be dependent upon the rich person, right? So that's why the masses, however, are much easier, right? 
they're the ones you want to go for first um, because they're much easier to please than the rich nobles because um, because Machiavelli says anyone who can promise the peasants security and freedom will always win their lasting support. And folks, this is why in every political commercial or campaign you see, they always hammer in the idea of, I'll make America strong again. We'll be, you know, the strongest country in the world, like we aren't already for some. Or, you know, if I'm president, you know, we'll get back our freedom, like somehow we don't have it. Like, so, you know, to win the peasants, to win the simpletons, to win those that don't have the math, the richness or the power, the nobility, all you have to do is grant them security and freedom. And, um, and as long as you give them that, that's really all that they want, right? And as we know, like we mentioned earlier, like there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine pawns but only two rooks, only two knights, only two bishops, one king, one queen. So you can get 10 mangy dogs can kill one noble lion. That is why Machiavelli says, first get the masses. Once you have the power of the masses, then you leverage that into getting the support from the nobility. Because even because if you do that and say the nobles say, damn, man, the the common people, you know, uh, the lower middle class folks, they really dig you, uh, you know. So before I give you this money for your political campaign, just promise me you'll do X. Well, someone who has the masses can say to hell with X. I'm not going to do that. Why? Why would I have to? I have the masses behind me. All you have is your pocketbook, your wallet. Yes, it, that money can take me a long way, but so can a lot of people. So that's why Machiavelli says, first win the masses, because there's more of them, and they want simpler things. And once you have them, then you can leverage that into telling the rich nobles what to do. All right? So that's the first way to keep power. Get the masses, like before you, you know, take down your manager or you take down your boss or you take down a king or queen, you got to get the court. You got to get the people to be on your side first. Win hearts and minds, then you can get rid of the tyrant. Okay? Um, the next strategy is, well, once you're in power, is it better to be feared or loved? So fear or love, what should a good ruler, good prince have? Ideally, you would want both, obviously. You obviously would want to be both feared and loved. But Machiavelli realizes that much like Fortuna, love is changeable. You can be in love with one person for a week, and then all of a sudden, bang, it changes, and then you're out of love, right? Or you could love bowling, and you bowl for 10 years and all of a sudden it just bores you and you fall out of love. So love is good, grand, lovely, all that, but it's temporary. This is why he says fear. Fear is a much better tool to control the population because it's a much more reliable emotion. He states his words, love is held together by a chain of obligation, promises. And because men are sadly wicked and selfish, those promises are usually broken at every opportunity as long as it serves their self-interest. Remember Hobbes, self-interest. But fear, on the other hand, that's maintained by a sense of dread and punishment which never abandons you. Here's what he means by that. Let's say you grew up in your typical nuclear family, which is mom and dad love each other, have kids, right? Let's just say you live in that type of household. All right. 
you turn, I don't know, you're, you enter puberty and you're at the grocery store and you just want to steal that candy bar, right? Your parents taught you not to steal, probably. Let's assume they did. And they love you heart and soul. Is that love going to stop you from taking the candy bar as efficiently as saying, let's say you were raised in that same family, but the father, he believed in a lot of spanking. When you did something bad, he'd whip off the belt and just tear your ass apart. Is that going to prevent you from taking that candy bar more than love? Nine times out of 10, it is. That's why he says fear is such a much more reliable emotion to keep power than love is. This is why, like when a president is in power, or when anyone's in power, they love to create an enemy. They love to create a bad guy because the bad, because the bad guy isn't us. The bad guy's not me. The bad guy's not part of us. It's something alien. So to keep us in fighting position to take on the bad guy, you gotta keep me in power. Because if you vote for someone else, you could be voting for someone weak, someone who's not going to address this fear that could hurt us, right? And what do we do? We vote for the one who Machiavelli says earlier will give us security and freedom. Even though the fear just may be some ghost on the other side of the ocean that has never come over here, fear is just so much more reliable. I mean, this is why, like for example, in the Jewish tr religion, they don't even believe in the idea of a hell. Uh, but in like Christian, uh, in the Christian mythology, they very much believe in hell. And that fear of punishment usually keeps those people in line a lot more than just saying, uh, Allah loves you, Jesus loves you, Krishna loves you. Okay, cool. Well, that's just the same thing as your parents loving you. But is that love going to prevent you from doing bad things? You may not do bad things because you don't want to disappoint them, but disappointing isn't the same as a lack of love, but no fear. The fear of going to jail, the fear of the death penalty, the fear of any of heights or whatever, that will stick with you or the population you seize to control a lot more. <sighs> It's, it's just like glue compared to water, you know. Fear is the glue that can kind of keep a society united against another society. But love is like the weather. It can come and go. Um, this is why Machiavelli says, and this is important to know, if you're going to do an evil act, right? If you're going to do something that most ethical philosophers or just every any other person would consider an evil or bad act, if you're going to do something like that, you got to do it, like you said, let me just read it. So you, any evil acts to obtain power must be done at the beginning of any campaign and all at once. It has to be done all at once. This way, your followers won't see your evil acts as being a habit, but they'll just see it as a necessity. What he means by that, to give you an example, take when the United States nuked Japan. Okay. You know, when we nuked Japan, we nuked them twice. And pretty much, you could say, at the same time. We had to do it that way. Like, we couldn't nuke Hiroshima one day, wait a month later, and then nuke Nagasaki the next day, or the next month, and then nuke Beijing three months later, and then Moscow. If we would have done it that way, the world would have united against us rather than the world uniting against them. <laughs> because they would have seen us nuking 
cities as a habit rather than a necessary evil. And that's why we drop both nukes at one time, just to say, yes, this is an evil act, but this is our strength. This is American virtue. And by doing this, we create the fortuna of the opportunity to have peace and now a good global commerce between Japan and America. But it had to have been done by first doing an evil act at it wasn't at the beginning of the war, but it was certainly done all at once. And when you do it all at once, like I said, it, people won't see it as a habit. They'll just see it as you had to do it because it was a one-time necessity. Right? It's like someone, if you shoot someone and you kill them, but you did it because they broke into your house, the judge would say that's self-defense because it was a necessity. But if you keep building up a track record of wow, this person has shot six people because somehow they all six of them have broken into their house. Well, then the detective is going to get suspicious and going to see that killing as a habit, serial killer, and therefore they it becomes an evil, then they get caught, then, you know, then they go to jail rather than it being a necessity. So that's why um, he says, if you're going to do fear, and fear is usually evoked through an evil, what we would generally consider an evil action. It's got to be done in, like all at once. You can't stagger it. You can't, you know, give it to me piecemeal. You've got to let me gorge on it. That way, um, like I said, it's not a habit, but a necessity. And the other thing to keep in mind is if it becomes a habit, that's the same thing as creating fear. And Machiavelli does make a big difference. He says, being feared is not the same as being hated. Hated is something that will take your power away. Because hatred can lead men to action even when they're afraid. But if someone's just afraid, they're usually not prone to engage in action. But hatred, hatred leads to rebellion. And Rebellion is the opposite of keeping your power, okay? So there's a difference, like, be feared. Just don't be hated. If, you, if you're hated, you've gone too far. And they'll let you know. <laughs> now, the last strategy on keeping your power that you need to be aware of is essentially how to keep, your, to keep yourself, your, your power, from becoming stale. Machiavelli says, in order to make sure that you're always on the top of your game, to make sure that uh, you're always performing at peak performance, you have to surround yourself with sharks, you know, metaphorical sharks, people who may want your job, people who may be smarter than you or have different virtues than you. You want to to surround your pe yourself with people who have a lot of virtue that helps you achieve, that helps you keep your power. You do, you do not want to surround yourself with yes men. You don't want to surround yourself with people who are just going to agree with everything. Because if they agree with everything, then there's no reason for you to become better. Because if everything you say is already, oh, that's a brilliant idea. Well, if it's already brilliant, why change, right? So this is where the motto, and you had this on a test question once, where it says, keep your enemies, I mean, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies even closer. Because back then, you know, if your enemies were close, you could always observe and see and have the intelligence to know how to counteract every chess move they made against you. Plus, um, like I said, when you surround yourself with people who want your position, it just consistently makes you have to be better than what you already are. Right? And, it's, and what he says, in a world of evildoers, the only way to secure happiness is to become as corrupt as them and play the game, right? 
In other words, a prince must learn how to swim with the sharks. If you surround yourself by goldfish, you're going to be a goldfish. You're going to get eaten by the shark. If you surround yourself with sharks, then you become just as deadly and ferocious as they are. And you create more. And a, someone that has that much, a shark has more virtue than, say, a goldfish, because a shark can create more fortuna than, say, a goldfish can. Right? And this is why Machiavelli supports what's called the ungolden rule. The golden rule. We've probably of all heard, treat your neighbor like you treat yourself, right? Seems like a good rule. That's what Hobbes said. That's what you need to create a social contract. But Machiavelli says, no, that's, that's naive if you're trying to gain power. The, ungol on, <laughs> the ungolden rule says, do unto others what you expect they're going to do to you. <laughs> so... If you know that person X is going to is going to is jealous of you and is going to try to take something you own, well, the golden rule will say, "Well, let me treat him nice and kindly, and maybe he won't be jealous and steal my stuff." Like I said, Machiavelli says that's naive, you know, gullible. He says if you know someone's jealous and wants to take your stuff then the ungolden rule says, I need to counter that or, you know, kill the baby in its crib by, by somehow taking his own jealousy and turning it against him. Or if he wants to steal something, maybe you drop something within ears, like say you work together and he's two cubicles away and you go, yeah, I'm going to be out of town for two weeks. And, you know, I just got some renovations done and the damn uh, painters lost my key. So there's no way for me to lock the door. Uh, you know, hopefully I live in a good neighborhood and no one will steal my stuff. That guy hears that. Then let's say you are gone for vacation or whatever. You can let your neighbors know, keep an eye out for if this car shows, if anyone shows up, you know, it's not me automatically call the police. I don't care if it's, if it ain't a mailman, if someone comes to my house, neighbor, call the police no matter what. And then that way you arrest that guy. And that's the ungolden rule. Treat them like they treat you. All right. Um, and that's why Machiavelli says the ends justify the means. And this is what's called having dirty hands. All right. Dirty hands is basically, like I said, when the ends justify the means. You can always identify a prince who has kept power for a long time because, as, you know, poetically saying, their hands are drenched with blood. You know, they've been, you know, they've been through so much. They've had to make, break so many eggs to make so many omelets. They've burned so many bridges to cross so many rivers that, you know... That's the ungolden rule. That's how you keep power, all right? So just to recap, the two strategies to gain power are virtue and fortuna, right? Those two things combined will gain you the power. Now, once you have it, you have the more difficult task of keeping it. And the strategies, and if you want to get more strategies, just read the book, The Prince. Um, but the ones that you'll be tested on are... Um, like I said, uh, either who do you get your support from, the nobles or the masses? The other one, is it better to be feared or loved? And how to keep your power from becoming stale, you know, surrounding yourself with sharks, practicing the ungolden rule, and having dirty hands. All right? So, folks, that's Machiavelli in a nutshell. All right? Um, this will be the final philosopher that we'll have before your next essay exam. So, um, enjoy. <laughs>